Okay, hello. <clears throat> We're going to start our second uh, makeup lecture, uh, and it's going to cover the the med medieval period and the Gothic. Uh, the Gothic is still under the medieval period, but I kind of separate them here because there there is some difference. You get, basically, you got the medieval period, and you have the Romanesque and the Gothic underneath it. But I don't know, I just it's it's okay like this. It would clarify it like this. So the medieval period is going to start after the fall of the Roman Empire. Now the Roman Empire, <coughs> I think they, it started falling apart uh, three, you know, 300 years AD, but really it pretty much officially, I think 476 AD. So the Roman Empire is gonna fall apart right before uh, 500 AD. Uh, so 1500 years ago. So that's when it, that's when it basically falls apart. And what, and some very, very important things happened with the fall of the Roman empire. The Roman empire had a, a, again, just very general basic things so that I can tell you some things that you're going to need that are important later. And we need to have some comparisons, some base knowledge about some things. So here we have, we've got the Roman empire. The Roman empire has a very, very strong central government. It was Rome. And even though the Roman Empire stretched out most of the known world uh, from the Middle East, parts of Africa, uh, Spain, uh, France, uh, Great Britain, all up into, uh, way up into Great Britain, not all the way, but almost uh, Germany, all those different places, parts of the Soviet Union. So there was a, a, a vast, huge area, especially around the Mediterranean Sea, that, uh, that the Roman Empire uh, was a huge, vast, very powerful uh, 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 period uh, uh, for about 500 years. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about because of the collapse of that very, very strong, powerful Roman Empire, like you can be in France and you uh, broke a law, uh, it would, you're breaking the law of the whole Roman Empire. Uh, it's very similar to, not exactly, but kind of similar to if you think about the United States. The United States, we have, you have city laws, uh, you have county laws, you have state laws, and you have federal laws. So even though we have all these different states, you got Kansas, Missouri, California, New York, Illinois, uh, you have these different states that people live and there's laws there. But when you commit certain crimes, it's a federal law and you have a federal government, a centralized government over everything that kind of consistently holds everything together generally. So what we have is we have the Roman Empire, which has a strong central government, and we go to this medieval period that has absolutely no central government. So the, the, our society is completely changed. So what happens is generally during the medieval period, <coughs> you have some countries that are strong. France, France is going to be strong. Uh, Spain will have periods of time of strength in Great Britain, uh, Germany and other places. But generally, you're gonna, what we're going to talk about is you're going to have a city. And you're going to have a city that has a king. And, and that king is going to rule over an area and rule over a group of subjects. And, and for those subjects uh, to, be, to have their king, the king would protect them and they would work for him. And then they would gather within the walls of, uh, of that city for protection. Because without a central government, if you were just wandering around the country, uh, you would, someone would knock you on the head, knock you out and take everything you have or kill you. Uh, you had protection. Uh, the kingdoms uh, gave you general protection. And we're going to talk about that here in a few minutes. Okay, so here we go. Uh, some basic things I want to talk about. Uh, cursor's kind of stuck. Okay, here we have a very typical medieval uh, altarpiece for a church. Uh, uh, very ornate, very, very beautiful. But there's a couple things I want to show you about some of the medieval work. First of all, if you take a look at this piece, you'll see these figures right here. Look at the face of this figure. Look at the face of that figure and that one. It looks like it's the same person. It pretty much is. When the artist, because there wasn't individuality like there was during, like there kind of was during the Roman period, in the Renaissance period, we'll have individuality, and that's one of the important things about the Renaissance. But during this medieval time, uh, either the church or the kings, or a combination of the both, wanted to keep their servants down. 
They want to keep the people down. They didn't want you intelligent. They didn't want you traveling and doing wonderful things. Uh, they, they knew 2,000 years ago, scientists knew the, earl, the world, world was round. 2,000 years ago, the world was round. Matter of fact, the scientists, they put a, a stick in the ground, they saw a shadow, they timed the shadow, and they got actually pretty close to finding out how big the world was. They knew and understand that the earth went around the sun. There's a lot of things that they knew. But then when we get into this medieval period, and let's say uh, powerful kings didn't want their people getting real smart, people didn't read, books were not available, and, uh, and they were told what to believe and what to know. So they, a good example is that people were taught that the world was flat. The world was flat, and if you sailed out your boat out in the ocean, you would fall off the ocean, you'd be eaten by dragons and things like that. It would be this horrible death. So they, they kind of scared people uh, in ignorance to stay put and be subservient uh, uh, to the kings. And uh, so what happens is uh, the artwork is going to, we're talking about the artwork, uh, the artwork is going to take a, a back seat. So it's going to be, you know, the Greek period is going to be a high point. The Romans are going to be a little bit less than that when it comes to artwork. Wonderful architecture, but the artwork a little bit lower. And they're going to get thrust into this 1,100 years of those dark ages of uh, the medieval period. And, uh, and art has, almost all the art has a purpose for the church and for religion. Uh, almost Everything, it, it, most of the pieces will go to uh, to churches, by the church will commission it, or you have wealthy people that will have religious work done that they donate to the church, or they might keep in their own personal chapels. But, uh, but most of the work is going to be religious or wartime oriented, uh, but it's not going to have a variety, a large variety of different subject matters. So here we have, when you normally have a woman with a halo and a little baby with a halo, you have the mother Mary and the, and the Jesus baby is what you have here, but everyone's looking about the same. Okay. Now this piece right here is an altarpiece also, but this is a very cool altarpiece. What happens here is you have, you have Christ with the cross and then you have these two wings, these two doors, and you can see the hinges right here. You can see a hinge here, 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 and here. And those two wings, are just like doors and they will close together like this. And when those, see they're both half sizes. And when those two wings close, they are the same size as the painting of Christ holding the cross. So what happens is this would be uh, behind an altar in a church uh, for, the, for the priest uh, when he teaches a, a, ser excuse me, a sermon or a mass. Uh, when those doors close, there'll be a painting on the outside. So it might be the birth of Christ. So he might talk about the birth of Christ in a, in a sermon or something. But if you want to talk about, you know, Christ walking on water, he would open up those panels and you can see on the left, there's, there's Christ walking on water. So he can talk about that. It's kind of the visual effects uh, for the mass that was going to be done. And, and this is a beautiful altarpiece. Nelson Art Gallery has, it has some beautiful altarpieces. Some of them are, uh, 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 you know, 15 feet wide and 20 feet tall, just absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful altar pieces from uh, the medieval period. Okay, this is a piece that would have been from a uh, manuscript. Uh, this is about death, and you see people dead and people dying, and, uh, and this is uh, talking about death. Now, the interesting things about manuscripts during this time, they were very, very ornate. If, if you want to, you, you got to realize this 1460 is when the Gutenberg Press is going to be invented with movable type. So everything before that, uh, if you wanted a Bible, let's say, or book, let's say a Bible, uh, you'd go to a monastery. There's different things you can do, but you can go to a monastery and you would have a monk up there. And what he'd do is he would take a Bible and he would make paper or one of them would make paper, make the paper from scratch, beautiful paper. And then they would look at the first page and they would rewrite the first page and then do all kinds of fancy artwork around it. And this would be artwork that would be opposite a page uh, in a manuscript. So the book sometimes may take a whole year for someone to make it just all day, every day, long days making it. So books are relatively expensive and, and books were uh, relatively rare. People didn't read much anyways. Uh, they didn't have the ability to do so, but this, but manuscripts was another 
uh, high form of art during this period of time. Okay, this is a mosaic, just like we talked about the Romans had mosaics and the Greeks had mosaics. This is uh, a, a medieval uh, mosaic. Uh, this is done with uh, square glass tile and stone. Uh, I show the students when I did this lecture some mosaics I have in my home. Uh, I do mosaics with glass tile and, and stone tile, mostly marble, exact same materials that are in here. Uh, and I use it the same way uh, as the mosaics that I do a lot of my mosaics uh, when I do my artwork. My mosaics are, are a permanent piece of artwork. They can last for thousands of years uh, and, and they're just beautiful. And you'll find these mosaics in the churches you know, throughout the medieval period. I just wanted to throw this piece in here. I saw a book one time and the book had hundreds of images of babies. And, uh, and the babies are, look like ugly old men. They don't look like, like cute little babies. Yeah, there's a reason for that. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. Okay, again, uh, when you take a look at these figures right here, look at this person right here and the person right here these two people. All these people, they look exactly the same because the artist is <clears throat> using the same face. Like for example, if you wanted a piece of artwork done, you wanted your portrait done, you'd go to an artist, uh, let's say in the year 1200, you go to an artist and you had some money and you wanted your portrait done. Well, often what would happen is, <clears throat> or if you wanted a battle scene done, a famous battle scene, uh, the artist would paint people in the, in the, in the painting. They would use the same faces, but if they're going to do a painting of you, they would use one of the stock faces, boom, they put a generic face on a body, and then they would paint your clothes, your horse, your house. So when people saw the portrait, uh, they would know it was you because of the things around you, not because of what your face looked like is because of the things around you. So here we have a battle scene where everyone's, everyone just looks the same. And you also look in the background right here, this castle back here where there's a king and people are, are and there's another castle over there. So they're showing that there's two castles here and these are two castles that probably don't like each other. And these are two uh, armies, knights uh, that are brought together to be fighting. So this is probably uh, a painting of a famous, a famous battle between two kings. Okay, this piece here, I think it's just, it is, it's just hilarious to me. Here you have, again, the same faces. Here you have this person face, this person face, and this person face, and this person face. It's the exact same face. But don't you find it interesting that this guy right here has a sword and he's shoving it through the brain of this guy. This guy is shoving a sword through the heart of this guy. This guy is being killed with a sword going through his brain, and he has the same cheesy smile on it as everybody else does. There's, there's absolutely no consideration on human feelings and emotions and individuality here. None whatsoever. It's documenting something. That's what it is. It's just documenting an event usually. Okay, this piece is, a, is an important piece. <clears throat> it's important for what we're gonna talk about today. Here again, we have two cities, and this is probably uh, a painting to be reminiscent of a battle that took place between two kings. That happened a lot, happened all the time. Uh, so what you have is you have this, uh, this light castle and you have this dark castle. Well, first of all, that dark castle would be miles and miles away. I mean, many, 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 many miles away. And it wouldn't be half the size of the light castle. It wouldn't be there. So if this was really realistic, there would probably be this little tiny castle way, 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 way back there. But they want you to be able to see the other kingdom. They want to be able to see it and recognize it. So they put it right there. Now, the thing I want to show you about this though, is they had very bad sense of foreground, midground, and background. And then there's your background, your midground, and it's just not in, in perspective at all. But where we can really see this is right down here. Here you have these archers and these, these guys right here. And then these guys with the, with the red jackets with the gold cross, these guys are attacking this building. So they put their ladder down 
and they're going up the ladder and they're attacking these guys up there. Uh, these, these guys in the foreground, there's a river between them. There's like, there's hundreds of yards. Where they're at, there's maybe a thousand feet, hundreds of yards. So there's a massive amount of depth here. But they put the ladder in the foreground and they lean the ladder against the wall of the castle. There's just an absolutely, there's completely no sense of depth here. That's very, very important for what we're going to be talking about in our next lecture is a sense of depth is completely gone. Okay. Uh, when we think of <coughs> uh, Gothic or Romanesque or medieval architecture, a lot of them are churches. And what we have here is we have A cathedral and when you have cathedrals you have a Latin cross you have a main hallway this way then you have a main hallway this way and that is in the floor plan of a cross and then you will have the dome and then the baptistry will either be inside the building or it'll be right here out of our picture and there is a big baptistry outside this picture over here you just don't see it and then you'll have the bell tower and what I like about this picture right here is this is the Pisa Cathedral. And the Leaning Tower of Pisa is simply the bell tower to the Pisa Cathedral. They built this big, beautiful cathedral and they go to build the bell tower and they start getting almost done with it. And it was built on sandy soil and it started slanting. And there's a long story about that, which I'm not gonna deal with today. Uh, earlier Romanesque, early uh, medieval, uh, architecture, this would be a church. But what I want you to understand about this church is that it's, it's not very tall, it's not very wide, it's small in comparison to the others, but more importantly, it has small little doors and windows. And what that means is very little light is gonna get in there. If this building was large and had those little windows, almost no light would be in there. It'd be pitch dark inside there. And you'd have to have these walls of candles to have any light at all there. And it was a problem, it was problematic, problematic but it, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they did it that way. It was easier to build these smaller buildings. And then, and we're gonna get to that in a second. Uh, before I get away from the Romanesque, the Romanesque architecture, uh, this is a beautiful example of uh, something I need to explain to you. Uh, this front door to a church has Christ and the front, and Christ is there blessing people as they come to the church. And what was happening was if you lived in, in, in one town and you needed to go to Paris or you needed to go to Rome and it was five days walk, what would happen is if you left your home and you got a day's walk down the street and nighttime came, then the bandits would get to you, knock you on the head and steal everything and kill you and all that kind of stuff. You probably would not make it to where you were going. There was just too much uh, evil bandits out there. So what happens on the main roads from one place to another place, you would walk a day, and at the end of the, a day's walk from the town you were at would be a church. It might be a small little town of 200 people, but it's gonna have this huge church there. And that church, people would be welcomed into it, and here they're welcomed by the, the sculptures of Christ, and you're welcomed in there and you'd spend the night. And then when you'd wake up in the morning, they would have mass, and you would, you would have mass, you'd get food, and then they would send you on the way and you'd do another day walk until you get to another church. And there'd be a welcoming uh, sculpture and doorway and, and, and priests there. And they would house you and feed you and what they could do. And then um, in the morning, they would have mass again and they would send you on the way. And you would do that for four or five, six days, whatever it took for you to get to where you were going. And that's how you safely traveled because it was a lot safer to travel during the day than it was at night. And uh, so the Catholic Church got in the habit of doing uh, masses. Uh, I don't know exactly the correlation between, but I but I, I do have you know Catholic family and friends, and, and they go to mass during the during the week. They go to mass every morning before they go off to their daily things. They go to mass, and uh, that's the same thing that was happening here. Okay, now the inside of these churches, <clears throat> as they started getting bigger and the walls started getting taller. What was happening is they were too dark. So what happens is if you have 
a short little church with windows is dark. But if your church, if you build tall, remember these are arches. Okay, you see the arches? So what they do is they these little arches and little churches, they build tall, tall, tall walls with an arch on the top. And then if you did one arch and then another arch and another arch and another arch and another arch, you now have a hallway. And that big hallway is the inside of the church. So here we have this big hallway. And you remember how the Colosseum had arches one way and then arches the other way, and you had this double vaulted ceiling? That's what's happening here. We have arches going this way. We have arches going this way, this way, arches going this way, one's going this way, this way, this way. So by having a series of double arched, uh, double vaulted ceiling arches and with pillars placed in certain places, you can actually have a fairly large room with a really high ceiling. And, and, and with the really high ceilings, what it allowed you to do was to do uh, uh, was to do this. With the really tall ceilings, you can have huge massive windows and you can bring on all kinds of light in there. And this gets to be Gothic right here with Notre Dame. Uh, you know, this is Notre Dame with the high glass of line buttresses. I'm not gonna take the time to talk about that now. But also inside these churches, instead of a blank stone wall, the artist would carve figurines in it and instead of having an, an altar instead of having an altar piece uh, you know, the, the, that might be John the Baptist or, 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 or St. Peter and they would be able to make reference to the sculptures and their sermons also. Okay a lot of it was churches but I said sometimes the kings had things done and you have beautiful tapestries inside castles and things like that and other metal work. But one thing that really kind of bubbles out that's really kind of cool is some of the armature that was done. Uh, I've been in museums where they had, you know, 50 or 60 of these, and they're just absolutely beautiful, stunning. And not only do they do it for the knights, but they also do it for the horses. So the horses have these full armaments that are there. And, uh, and that's uh, some of the most beautiful artwork you'll see is some of the armaments of some of these knights. Okay, so here is a real good example. I've already mentioned this a little bit. So if there's, if there's a king and he has the subjects and during the day the subjects go out and they farm and they raise cattle and chickens and all that kind of stuff. And when nighttime comes, they all come back right here. They go on the drawbridge and they go inside and they live inside this castle. And they're, they're, they're fortified and they're protected by other people taking them and killing them. And a lot of times you have a moat around it with water, which makes it more difficult to attack. And then often you had an exterior wall that would take care of the first line of defense when people would attack you. But the main line of defense is gonna be further back with a taller wall with huge turrets and with people up there, you know, with arrows, with rocks, you know, you know boiling oil and things like that. If the first wall was breached, uh, then the second wall was was going to hold. And sometimes if you were going to take this city, it may take an army uh, months sometimes to uh, have a siege on a city to be able to take it over. Uh, but the moats really helped a lot. And here's a picture of one here in the middle of a lake. Uh, now, if you're a knight on your horse and you have 250 pounds of armor on you, you're not going to be able to walk across a lake that's 15 feet deep. You're going to drown. So it was very difficult to get to some of these and, uh, and some are very, very successful and built. You find them on the tops of hills. We have cl cliffs all over the place uh, where they build castles. Usually uh, it has a lot to do. Uh, this castle right here is in Spain, in Segovia, Spain. I have a photograph when I was a youngster standing right here. Uh, but this castle, what I like about this castle, uh, Disney, Walt Disney used this castle to uh, model the Magic Kingdom with. So this is in Segovia, Spain, and it's a, it's a beautiful castle. Okay, now we need to uh, uh, quickly deal with this. Again, uh, this is gonna be the Florence Cathedral, and the Florence Cathedral is gonna have a Latin cross. You're gonna go in the front door, all the way down, straight through, and then there's gonna be another hallway going this way, which will give you your Latin cross, and where the cross meets, you're gonna have a dome. And <clears throat> when you have that dome, uh, you, uh, so you have the Latin cross, a dome, you have the bell tower right here, and then you have the baptistry right here. So this is very typical. In Florence, 
Florence is very, very special. We're going to be talking about that. But Florence is incredibly special. Uh, this baptistry right here is the oldest uh, building in the city. It was built around the year 1000. Uh, there was another cathedral here that this went to, but they tore down that old cathedral because it wasn't big enough. And they tore it down and they built this cathedral. Uh, this, this cathedral, uh, again, has your Latin cross, bell tower, and the baptistry. Uh, this is the corner of it. When you're standing by the front doors, one of the front doors right there, it's very ornate, very beautiful. Uh, this is the side T to the cross, and that's the dome up there. Okay. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit the lecture right here, and this is going to be... Uh, the medieval uh, Gothic uh, lecture. And then uh, we'll start another lecture that will be, uh, that will start with the Florence Cathedral Dome. Okay, so we're gonna stop here and uh, we'll see you the next lecture. Thank you.